Now, I'm not sure if you heard, uh, but TJ Dillashaw uh, <laughs> got popped uh, for EPO. Can you uh, talk about that and how it probably was not a mistake? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I definitely heard. I mean, that's, uh. that's in my, my wheelhouse in my department. And, you know, there's a couple things. Said. Number one, I'm in this position into rubbing salt in the wound. Sure. TJ is now suspended for two years, which I think is very significant. Um, you look look response to it, Matt. You know, I, I watched your video. Um, I think that's very significant too. He's definitely taken a beating publicly. Um, I do think there is something to be, for, you know, admitting right away a wrongdoing and guilt, which which he did very quickly here. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's shitty. I, I don't yeah. think it's happening when any of our fighters test positive. Uh, but hopefully, you know, other fighters see that and say, hey, we're not fooling around with this program. It doesn't matter where you fall on the UFC roster, whether you're a current champion, former champion, or you're, you know, first fight in the UFC. Everybody's being treated equally. And anyone runs afoul of the program, you know, they're going to be sanctioned accordingly. accordingly. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think that, uh, I think as far as him accepting it, I think he was caught. So I think he shouldn't get a a pat on the bat for saying, hey, man, I did it, because you know what? You guys caught him. He didn't come out and say, guys, you know what? Take that. You know, maybe you should test that again. No, he got caught. What else is he going to do, you know? And this is a big thing. He did an apology. And in that apology, I didn't hear one anything for the guys that he fought when he was on this, unless he's saying it was one time, but I wouldn't believe a word he said. And their families. He mentioned that he had a kid. What about their kids? I'm going off now, Jeff. I'm sorry. Let's get back to the uh, business at hand. <laughs> that TJ's a cheater. I think yeah, two. Hey, know, personally, I, Jeff, I think two years is too little. Yeah, I, I can't argue. You know, with any of those, and a lot of people have you know those same same thoughts. I, I will tell you that in my experience, both in this UFC program and then previously, you know, and I've dealt with hundreds of athletes that have used, that have gotten caught and uh, red-handed. And not everybody's done with TJ. And others, you know, will deny it to their grave. Um, but yeah, I mean, hey, this sport, and this is why I love this sport so much and feel so proud of what we're doing here. The importance level of anti in this sport, you know, far outweighs any other sport in the world, in 100%. my opinion, in my experience. Yep. So I get everything you're saying, and hey, that's why Lorenzo and Dana brought me here four years ago to put this together because of those things you're saying. That you know, yeah. you're looking out for health and safety of the human beings more clearly in this sport than any others when it comes to anti-doping. Dana made a point too about the amount of money he pays Usada. Why are they not checking this all the time? And I know you clarified that. But can you explain uh, to us why they're not looking at it in every test? And I also, a follow-up question is, why do tests take so long? Like, if they're going to test you uh, right before the fight, why can't they get a quick result? Yeah, well, I mean, when it comes to the EPO test, um, it takes three days just to prepare the urine sample for testing. Uh, there's certain, you know, chemical things that they have to do to it just to prepare it to put it on the machine. So, unfortunately, that's just the reality of the science behind it. Um, yeah, when it comes to why isn't the test done for EPO, I, I think maybe to just simple terms, in the in the course of our testing program, four years in the UFC, we've only had two positive US uh, EPO tests. Wow. Um, that being said, you know, looking back at the percentage of EPO tests that we've done, you know, we've had about 12,000 tests done in the history of this program and i don't know specific numbers but what i do know is epo testing is done at more than 30 percent of the samples um the reason that it's not done on every sample is because a it's expensive and b if you look at the statistics ours being that epo is not the most commonly used performance enhancing drug so why would you want to dedicate all these testing dollars to a drug that's not the most common drug. So again, in simple terms, $100 for your program. The standard panel, the most common drugs we find, steroids, stimulants, SARMs, say it costs a dollar to test, and the EPO test, $4 to test. So if you had $100, you did EPO testing on every sample, 
that would be a total of five dollars one for the standard uh panel and four for the epo so that would be 20 tests for dollars um versus say you did you know 10 each um that would be 40 dollars for the epo and then you'd have 60 tests for the most common drugs that we find um dedicated to that so it's you know, it's a numbers game and and every test i say this all the time every test that you saw does is for a purpose there's a reason behind it. They're not drawing names out of a hat. They're not drawing what test is coming out of a hat. They study this, there's statistical analysis done, They're looking at our athletes' biological passports to see if anything's suspicious that would trigger an EPO test. Um, so, you know, again, EPO is, while it's, I think, a dangerous drug, it's a drug that would be very, you know, beneficial to a UFC fighter. It's not, uh, you know, on the scale of commonness, it's not the most common drug and so why would you dedicate all your testing dollars to a drug that's not as commonly used as the others? Can you speculate or, or do you know why you said it would, uh, your biological makeup, what tests were done? What was it that triggered it where they wanted to test TJ? That I don't know. And they don't, you know, it's a reason there's a purpose why USADA does not share that information with me. Their administration program is independent of the UFC, so there can be no favoritism. Sure. There could be no tip fighters to why something is happening. Uh, so they keep that information, you know, somewhat proprietary um, and don't even share it with me. Um, I, I can guess or imagine that, you know, something may have triggered on his biological passport. I can guess that potentially, you know, USADA has a toll free tip line where athletes or camps can call in with tips. You know, maybe they got some tips on him. Um, I don't know, but again, there, there's a purpose behind why they do. They don't do it just by you know drawing a name. Oh, okay. That's that. Hey, Jeff, is it correct that TJ's test against Cody Garbrandt was retested and came back negative for EPO? No, that is not true. Uh, okay. What is true is Usada you know, came down. I asked them without getting specific and look at those Cody fights and even, you know, further back than that when he fought uh, John Lineker yeah. and I think Javier Asensio. And what they told me, although not specific, is surrounding all of those fights, either, you know, in the time before, the time after, in some cases both, there were PO tests done on him and uh, he was negative for those tests. Oh, so they didn't have to retest the samples because they're saying they were already done. They did. They did. The samples. There were some samples that were done for EPO. Not necessarily um, all of them, but around surrounding all of those sites, they let me know that there were some samples done for EPO. The one test I did go back and retest was the December test that they had collected from him leading up to the Cejudo fight. They didn't have an EPO analysis done on it. They retained that sample, went back and tested that, and that was positive uh, for EPO as well. Oh, it was positive. No, this is around uh, Cejudo, not uh, C Cody. You're oh, yeah, Cody. oh, yeah. But, well, Cody Garbrandt tweeted, to test all samples, I bet for a fact more EPO pops up. And then he calls TJ, you know, he's, he's a coward. And then he says, TJ, well, then he's called him a scumbag and stuff. But he said to test them all. And he guarantees he's going to get more pops. So, I mean, if I was Cody, though, I would be, like, livid. I would be, like, 100% test my fights again. I don't care if this... So who's saying not just because they gave tests around that, they can't specifically say they tested for both Cody's fights with him. They're saying they didn't. Correct? Yeah. Well, well, again, again, there were tests done in the immediate vicinity of those fights. Um, I, I say that every single test that they did on TJ around those done for three PO, but there was there was some EPO testing done around those fights, and again, they came back negative. You should, currently in the process going back and looking to see if any of those were samples remain um, not only does USADA retain samples sometimes laboratories on their own will retain samples and so they're going and searching through that database and you know should any be remaining they will definitely go back and test those how long do they save them for Jeff sorry do you, do you know like how, cause it seems like just storing blood for X amount of years how, how long would the typical fighters sample be saved they can save them for up to 10 years okay. under our policy. And it's, again, just because of storage space and cost, it's not every single one. But, you know, again, nothing's done randomly. There's a purpose behind every sample they keep, but there are samples that are cast for potentially up to 10 years. So they will be going back and testing those, those Cody fights. 
PPO. If, it, if there are remaining, correct? And, you know, the other reason that they keep these samples is it acts as a detection. So if an athlete's out there that has a new drug that they think is under test all the time, I mean, we educate all of our athletes that, hey, just because you think you may be getting away with it now, you know, five yeah. years, ten years from now, new science may come about that can detect this. And so you might not be fighting anymore, but your legacy, you know, will still be around and could take a hit oh, um, if there were retests like that. Okay. Well, yeah, his, his legacy already took a, a, a major hit. And, and do you think, uh, Jeff, that it, we, again, I know you can only speculate as to why any athlete would take uh, any particular drug, but do you think that an athlete dealing with going to a, uh, a division down in weight could that somehow benefit him? Could that motivate someone to do a one-time thing with EPO? Yeah, you know, potentially. Um, you know, EPO has got a lot, of, a, a lot of properties that would help uh, a UFC fighter. Um, definitely would give you more endurance because it creates more red blood cells. And red blood cells, well, their job is to bring oxygen to your muscles as they're working hard. So it's good for endurance. It's very good for recovery. Um, from what I've been told anecdotally from those athletes who have used it, you can work out as hard as you can imagine every day of the week and wake up the next morning feeling great. Um, I've also been told anecdotally it has a small you know, anabolic effect where it would potentially cut down on body fat and increase lean muscle. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I can't get in, into the head of TJ or sure. anybody else and why they used it, but certainly there's, there's a lot of properties that would benefit the UFC fighter. Okay, and um, let me ask you about uh, also a, f a fighter who's not as commonly spoken about, but there's a lifetime ban. He's the first fighter. Uh, is it uh, Ruslan Magomedov? Is that how you say his name? Or Ruslan? Yeah. Yep. He, he was a heavyweight. Can you, what, what, what happened to him? He just wouldn't stop? Yeah, so he, uh, he had a positive test for which he was uh, sanctioned for two years. And during that period of time, and, and TJ and anybody else under sanctions including, included in this, you're, you still continue to be tested. During the course of your sanction, it's not like, okay, you can go away and, and do whatever you want. Masada will still show up regularly and test you. So in regards to Ruslan, they showed up again during his two-year sanction. That test came back positive. Um, hadn't been adjudicated yet when they went back to him for a third time. And when they asked him to provide a sample, uh, he declined. He said, basically, look, I'm through with this. I don't want to provide a sample. And outright refusal to provide a sample is considered a violation. So he was looking at, you know, not only the first, which he was currently under sanction, but a second, and under our policy, a third time sanction is a lifetime ban. And he didn't want to fight it. And uh, I don't think had any, you know, reasoning of why he declined the test. And, so he's not going to be able to compete for the UFC. Ever. Did you, um, I don't want to, to, to switch gears too much, but it sort of kind of reminded me that when you'd mentioned uh, how much Melanagi is making, um, Tito Ortiz came out and said Dana White was right about Oscar De La Hoya promoting MMA. Oh, really? I never saw that. No, please, please tell me. This was pretty, it was pretty interesting. Um, I mean, I guess he was just talking about. Um, just fighter pay and just talking about uh, how here let me see the actual quote um, well well, before you bring that up I mean I think Tito and Chuck both earned somewhere around the ballpark of $200,000 each yeah. uh, which for guys of their stature isn't a lot of money you know yes it's still a lot of money but for guys like that you know uh, they thought they were going to do terrific pay-per-view numbers and once again I could be mistaken so don't quote me but I'm led to believe it did around 60, 70, 75,000 pay-per-view buys so you know I don't think anybody got rich out of that so um, so yeah, so maybe Tito has uh, you know he, he, he's got an axe to grind he's probably kind of pissed off he went out there he promoted it he did it he upheld his end of the bargain whereas Oscar De La Hoya didn't really do much he couldn't even remember the, the fighters names at the press conference yeah well exactly you know Dana White I guess went off on a, a little bit of a tangent about how you know the, people like to shit on what the UFC does um, and I've said this for a very long time and I, I will I will never be paid by the UFC to do anything I promise you I, this, this is not the, the angle that I would ever try to to get on but the UFC have developed a really sustainable model and, and made 
millionaires out of a lot of fighters created you know i, I mean we're we're giving actual real careers to hundreds if not thousands of people i mean uh, th it's not thousands of fighters but thousands of people they've created a legitimate industry so when people shit on sort of the business model i'm going like guys there are so many people that eat off of this and eat really well. I get, I have to give so much respect to Dana White and the Fertitta brothers and what they built, you know, with this sport. And I think it's a little bit, it's just very short-sighted. People don't know what it's like to run a business. They don't know what it's like to run a fucking podcast network, much less, much less a multi-billion-dollar mixed martial arts organization. Um, so people like to to shit on them, and I guess um, Dana White went off on a little bit of a tirade. And after the smoke cleared, um, you know, the, the what Tito said was his quote is, I think he made a lot of mistakes, but at the time for a boxing promoter to come into mixed martial arts, it's a different animal. Dana was right. Um, meaning all the stuff that Dana said about him not knowing how to build an MMA organization. And if, you know, they had one meeting with Oscar De La Hoya, they'd see exactly how much he knows about MMA, which is nothing. Um, and then you look at the fighter payouts and there was guys making $1,500 on that card. Um, you know, people like to talk shit, but that just doesn't happen in the UFC anymore. There was literally a, like three or four fighters that made 1500 bucks, 2000 bucks to go and put their life on the line um, on what was supposed to be the biggest competition for the UFC and being marketed as like what they're doing, they're doing right for the fighters it was just sort of bullshit yeah well you know i mean he, he raises a lot of valid points there you know but for, for oscar to come out and say they were really going to rival the ufc i mean that was kind of lunacy right from the start but regarding the fight to pay i mean that's how it is it's certainly when you come from the boxing world you look at boxing fights you know the guy at the top the main event you know let's say deontay wilder at the weekend we'll talk about that in a moment i've got something to say on that but um you know, he, I don't know what his purse was. He will have made a lot of money. But as you trickle down, and I'm not talking about this fight card in particular because I don't know what the payouts were, but generally in boxing, main event gets paid millions upon millions. And then down the bottom, you might have guys fighting for $500. I think on the Mayweather... Uh, Pacquiao fight, which was like four point something million pay per view buys. That was there was guys on there making five hundred dollars on the early fights, and that's just how it is. And you know it's funny because I was having this conversation with one of the stunt guys yesterday. We were driving back to the hotel, and he was asking, "Yeah, but you know you don't really get paid." I said, "Well, you know the big guys now in MMA they do, you know." And he said, "Well, yeah, but it's still a long way from boxing." I said, "Yeah, you're right, it is, but still, you know there is money." to be made and there's very very good money if you can become a world champion if you're one of the best if you're a main event if you're a mainstay of the promotion you're going to make good money you know and will it go up yeah it'll go up it's been going up all the time if you look at the trajectory if it was a graph it's going up oh, it's yeah. definitely trend trending upwards and it hasn't been around as long as boxing um but still, if you look down on the bottom, I'm not sure what the minimum is, but I think it's 15 and 15, or it might be 10 and 10, but it's around that mark. Now listen, when you do a training camp, let's say you win your fight $20,000, you know, that it doesn't, it's, it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but you know, it would have been to me back in the day. You do a training camp, say you lose your fight, you've got to pay taxes and all that stuff. So you may be not left with a lot, but that's the risk you take as a professional fighter. You yeah. know what I mean? You've got to start somewhere. Like, you know, when we started this podcast, we made zero money. Now we make just enough to pay Harrington. You know, so we're going places. <laughs> you know, but, but, but when we started, we started on nothing. And yeah. when you're a professional fighter, just like my first ever professional fight, I wasn't paid a penny. And then you slowly, incrementally, with every fight, you build your brand, you build uh, a profile, you get a following, you work your way up, you get more and more and more. And then if you're good enough, then you start making some real money. So there, those fighters, you know, just like me, you know, in the acting world, you know, I'm not talking about this show. This show is pretty good. But some of the work I've done, it doesn't pay very well, you know, because it's the building phase. It's the investment phase. I can't expect to walk into the acting world and get paid a ton of fucking money like a Vin Diesel might do just because I was a world champion MMA. No, I'm nobody in the acting world. So you got to work your way up. So sometimes, you know, my wife has said in the past about certain roles, as I said, not this one. This one pays pretty well. Um, why are you doing this one, Mike? You know, it doesn't pay well. I'm like, yeah, you got to work your way. you got to build your way. It's the investment phase. And it's the same thing with young fighters. When they start, you're taking a chance on yourself and you think, I might lose. And if I went and got 
a job, you know, working at whatever or using that degree I got at college, I could probably make more money. But I'm willing to bet on myself. I'm willing to take a gamble because I think I can win and I think I can become a main event and I think I can become world champion one day. So therefore, it's worth taking these small paydays now because it's going to pay off in the long, long run. And that's what every fighter in every sport, whether it's UFC or boxing or anything else for that matter, that's the way you all fucking start. Formula One drive. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button with its notification bell and leave a comment in the comment box below of what you thought of the video and tune in for more on MMA News Outlet.